Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 56, A Major Turn to the Right, Nicholas I Takes Control. Last week, we recounted Tsar Alexander I's reactionary second half of his reign and his mysterious death. Now we move on to his younger brother Nicholas I's reign with only one major problem. Nicholas is unaware that he is to succeed his brother. Now, according to the law passed by his father, Paul I, in 1797, Constantine, and not Nicholas, was the heir apparent when news came of Alexander's supposed death. It is at this point that a group of officers, led by five men, decided now is the time to overthrow the Romanovs and fight for a new constitutional government. At first, Nicholas hesitated taking the throne, waiting instead for Constantine to formally refuse the title. When no such letter came from his brother, who was in Poland, Nicholas still proclaimed allegiance to Constantine. When nothing came of that, on December 13, 1825, he proclaimed himself Tsar, which led many to believe that he was attempting to usurp the throne. The conspirators saw this as their moment to strike. They would depose Nicholas, name Constantine Emperor, and force him to accept a new constitution. Some 3,000 troops in St. Petersburg rose up in arms, killed the governor, General Mikhail Milodrovich, but were quickly met by 9,000 loyalist troops and captured. Nicholas tried to stop the uprising with a plea to give up without shedding blood, but in the end, four cannons were fired into the crowd of men, after a three-hour standoff with approximately 60 men dying. It was a total failure, with the seeds of revolution being planted and rising up again. But instead of this being started by peasants, now the nobility were involved. Five ringleaders were identified. and The first one will have a name that strikes uh, memories of the past. It was Nikolai Bestrushev Rumin. Now also... Peter Kakshovsky, Sergei Muryev Apostol, Pavel Pestel, and Kondraty Ryalev, all of whom were captured and executed on July 13, 1826. Many of the other co-conspirators were sent into exile in Siberia. Now, there were two groups here that were involved in the conspiracy, the Northern Society in St. Petersburg, who actually did the uprising, and the Southern Society in Tulchin. They were in communications during Alexander's reign and were planning on attacking in the future. But there were very important differences between these two groups. The Northern men were aristocratic and helped develop the French Constitution after defeating Napoleon. One of their conspirators wrote from his prison, quote, Did we free Europe in order to put in chains ourselves? Did we grant France a constitution in order that we dare not talk about it? And did we buy at the price of our blood preeminence among nations in order that we might be humiliated at home? Well, the Southern Society, now, that was much more radical. And while the Northern wanted a constitutional monarchy, the Southern wanted much more radical change. They were the basis for the revolutionaries that came in the early 20th century, especially the Bolsheviks. Their leader, Pavel Pestel, who served as a colonel in the Napoleonic Wars, considered himself a Jacobin revolutionary. He believed in private enterprise, but also wanted all men to be treated equally without a Tsar. One other issue was Pestel, with Pestel was that he was strongly anti-Semitic, and this was a growing movement among many Russians of all classes. This bloody beginning to his reign was to have a large impact on the next 30 years of Russia under Nicholas's reign. First off, it made him very wary of the Western influence that almost toppled him from the throne. This made him turn inward towards more Russian loyalists and traditions that would have made it impossible for anyone to simply overthrow the Tsar. Well, unless, of course, it was by members of your own family. Secondly, well, Russia was a world power first in Nicholas's mind, so he had to continue in the tradition of Peter, Catherine, and his older brother Alexander. He was destined to keep the expansion and glory coming, wasn't he? Well, to better understand Nicholas, we need to understand his childhood. 
Unlike his older brothers, who were taught by tutors handpicked by his grandmother, Catherine the Great, Nicholas grew up influenced by his father's erratic behavior and his ideals and tutors. Whereas Alexander was brought up to love education, Nicholas was not. Paul had instilled in him the Prussian military style of life, drilling the soldiers and more drilling. This made Nicholas hated by many in the military, especially those who were in close contact with the Tsar. A telling comment made by the new Tsar gives you an understanding of what he thought about life. Quote, All things flow logically one from the other. No one here commands without first learning how to obey. No one rises above anyone else except through a clearly defined system. Everything is subordinated to a single defined goal, and everything has its precise designation. That is why I shall always hold the title of soldier in high esteem. I regard all human life as being nothing more than service, because everyone must serve. It is this last chilling line that defines Nicholas's reign. Human life is meant to serve alone, and he would serve them up without qualms. Nicholas himself was an amazingly good-looking man. Many called him the handsomest man in Russia. He also almost exclusively dressed in military garb, almost never being seen in civilian outfits. He extended this to Russian society, encouraging all around him to embrace his father Paul's love of all things military. Remember from an earlier podcast on Emperor Paul that his influence was to cause problems when Nicholas grew up? Well, here's where it starts. The Marquis de Custine was to say, quote, The Russian government is the discipline of the camp substituted for civil order. It is a state of siege become the normal state of society. This normal state of siege mentality was to reign throughout Nicholas I's time. It would lessen with Alexander the Second and return with fury during the reign of Alexander the Third, and would lead to the intransient attitude of Nicholas the Second and the end of the Romanovs. Nicholas's wife, Frederica Louise Charlotte Wilhelmina of the Prussian Hohenzollern, became Alexandra Fedorovna. This oftentimes frail and sickly woman was to be the important cog in the continuation of the Romanov dynasty, as Alexander was childless and Constantine only had one daughter. Well, Nicholas, we know, was certainly fertile, as he fathered numerous children by his many mistresses. He had a number of kids by one of them, named Elena Andreevna Tsilevna, who were given the last name, these children, Nikolaev. His liaisons were known but kept very discreet, as he truly loved his wife. As Baroness Fredericks wrote, What an example Nicholas Pavlovich set for all of us in his deep respect for his wife, and how he sincerely loved and protected her to the last minute of his life. As is well known, he had love affairs on the side, but what man doesn't? Well, luckily for the Romanovs, Alexandra was a prodigious bearer of children, with seven. The first, Tsarevich Alexander, the future Alexander II, was born in 1818, followed quickly thereafter by Maria, Olga, Alexandra, Constantine, Nikolai, and Mikhail. The last three boys were to play important parts in the Russian government, with Constantine, the most liberal, becoming an admiral, Nikolai becoming army commander-in-chief, and Mikhail becoming inspector general of artillery. When Nicholas was coronated on August 26, 1826, there was a real marked difference of who was on display. Instead of all the noble families being on the rostrum, some of these families being prominent far longer than the ruling clan, now only the Romanovs stood tall. Their family was quite large by now and would only grow bigger with all the boys being born, giving or just fathering more children. I can only imagine the jealousy the old Boyar families had. Of course, that jealousy could never, ever be shown in public. While all the Tsars showed great pomp and circumstance, Nicholas became a grand master in orchestrating events, showcasing his family. He would have people carefully select members of the community to come and see how happy and domestic his life and his families were. One episode at Tsarskoye Selo, 
1842, even brought peasants there, showing them that life as a Romanov was grand. His people believed this to be an important means of making people happy and content, knowing that their little father, the Tsar, and the royal family were happy. And they wondered why the people would dare think of revolution 75 years later. But Nicholas wasn't all show. He did rule, and he wanted to reform certain aspects of life in Russia, but slowly, calculating every step. As he put it, change could come, quote, not by daring and rash dreams, which are always destructive, but gradually and from above, laws will be issued, defects remedied, and abuses corrected. In this manner, all modest hopes for improvement, all hopes for strengthening the rule of law, for the expansion of true enlightenment, and the development of industry, will be gradually fulfilled. The legitimate path, open for all, will always be taken by us with satisfaction. For we do not have, and cannot have, any other desire than to see our motherland attain the very height of happiness and glory preordained for her by providence. From this, we have a reform package known as the Nicholas System. This doctrine was to promote three key concepts, orthodoxy, autocracy, and national pride, known in Russian as Norodnost. Basically, the concepts made these things clear. Orthodoxy was the religion of Russia. Tradition, particularly Russian tradition, would save the country from the evils of the West, and generally, Russia was just damn better than every other country. Considering how conservative Nicholas was, it's really interesting to note that he recalled the liberal Mikhail Speransky to codify the new laws, which took seven years, from 1826 to 1833. This 45-volume piece of work was to be known as the Complete Collect of Russian Laws, which is known to historians as a treasure trove of insight into running of Russia, as well as its psyche. Now, as I mentioned in the Slapshot episode on serfdom, Nicholas knew the institution which enslaved the majority of the population was evil, but he could not bring himself to do the right thing. He felt it was still too early. The collective souls of the tens of millions of people groaned in agony. He had urged the large landowners to make the serfs', serfs lives better, but the speeches he gave were kept secret. Talk the talk. But don't let the talk be known, much less walk the walk. The economy in the early part of Nicholas's reign grew. Rail lines were being built, but their size was puny compared to, the, to Great Britain's. By the end of his reign, Russia had built 650 miles of rail line, compared to England's 7,000. But trouble was brewing back in Greece again, where the Turks continued their persecution of the Christians, especially in Constantinople, where they were forcibly expelled. A combined force of Britain, France, and Russia declared war on the Ottomans in response. Over the next year, the Allies won countless battles until Andrianople fell on August 19, 1829. The Treaty of Andrianople was signed the next month, marking the zenith of Tsarist expansion. But interestingly enough, the British and the French were out of the picture at the end. They began to fear the Russian bear. Next week, Nicholas becomes more reactionary, crushing any independent liberal thought in Russia. This preceded the beginning of a series of military disasters that helped eventually bring down the Romanovs, starting with the Crimean War. Well, we've been doing this week in Russian history for a year now, so we'll quietly retire that segment into the night. We will replace it with a reading from the past about a moment, an incident, a person, or a reflection about Russia and its people. This week, it comes from a Russian chronicler, Safoni of Ryazan, about the Battle of Kulikova and the victory over the Tatars in 1378, led by the Muscovite prince, Dmitri Donskoy. Great Prince Dmitri Ivanovich sets in the golden stirrup and takes his sword in his right hand. The sun shines brightly from the east, showing him the road to victory. 
The earth became black from horse hooves. The field became strewn with Tatar bones. Much blood was spilled upon the field. Strong regiments came together and clashed, and they trampled the hills and the meadows. The storm clouds began to gather, and from them shone the lightning, and thunder roared mightily. It was the clash of the sons of Russia and the Tatar infidels for the, to seek revenge for Tatar offenses. The gilt armor of the Russian princes gleamed. Their steel swords rained upon the Tatar helmets. Indeed, the tide turned, and the Russian regiments began to cut the Tatars to pieces, and despair seized the infidels. Princes fell from their mounts, and Tatar corpses began to cover the field, and blood flowed in a stream. The infidels began fleeing on all sides. And then Prince Dmitri Ivanovich addressed the dead. Fellow princes, boyars, and sons of boyars, you have found peace everlasting here between the Don and the Dnieper on the prairie of Kulikova. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Now, don't forget to join the Russian Rulers History Podcast Facebook group so you can ask a question, make a suggestion, even make a comment. And as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.